Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church, Winchester, Virginia's online worship service for this Sunday, April 18th, 2021. We're so glad that you have joined us for worship this morning. And later on today, we'll be gathering at 11 a.m. for a worship service in person at Hunting Ridge Retreat. If you'd like to join us for an in-person worship service, we invite you to come again and be with us there. The address is 1011 Hunting Ridge Road, Winchester, Virginia 22603, and we will be meeting up at the pavilion. There are seats for you there, or if you would like to bring a camp chair, we invite you to do so. We will continue to meet at Hunting Ridge Retreat every Sunday during the month of April, which means that next Sunday we will join together out there as well. But then beginning on May 2nd, we will gather for our 11 a.m. worship service back in our sanctuary. We are excited about resuming worship in our sanctuary space, but we know that some of you may not feel comfortable worshiping in person in a building yet. If that's the case for you, or if you are simply unable to gather with us there, we will be live streaming our worship from the sanctuary every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. on both Facebook and YouTube. And so we invite you to join us in one way or another for worship as we gather together. Today, we will continue our sermon series on the seven next words of Christ as we hear the assurance that we do not need to be afraid, even when we are filled with fear, for we are not alone and Christ is risen. Pastor Ethan will be bringing that message this morning. And like I said, we will continue that sermon series through Eastertide as we gather both at Hunting Ridge and then in our sanctuary and also online. Let's prepare our hearts for worship this morning now as we're led by our instrumental meditation. Will you join me now for our responsive call to worship? Do not be afraid. 
I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has been raised. Alleluia. Come with amazement and great joy. Come with wonder and praise. Let us shout the good news. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Let us worship God. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 through 39. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hi, boys and girls. I was wondering today, have you ever felt afraid? I bet your answer is yes. And I bet if you asked your parents or grandparents or other adults if they have been afraid, their answer would be yes too. Because all of us have been afraid from time to time. 
I remember when I was a little girl and I was really afraid of the dark. So at night, after my parents tucked me into bed, I would ask them to leave the door cracked so that I could see the light. They would leave a light on in the hall and I would keep my eyes trained on that little sliver of light through the crack in my door so that I wouldn't feel as scared. But sometimes that little sliver of light wasn't enough. I was still afraid. And so I would creep out of my bed to make sure that my mom and my dad were still there. Because sometimes when we are scared, we need to know that we're not alone. Think about it. If you see a big, scary dog, you want your parents to pick you up. If you have to go somewhere new, you want someone to go with you. In the Bible, scripture tells us, do not be afraid. It says it again and again and again. But it's important for us to notice that every time scripture tells us, do not be afraid, it also follows up with something important, something that we really need to know. A lot of the time, scripture tells us, do not be afraid, and then reminds us that God is with us. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, I'm going to go ahead of you. The women who came to Jesus' tomb were afraid when they found it empty, and the angel said, do not be afraid, and then they told him really good news. Christ isn't here. He's been raised. And for us, that's good news too, because that means that wherever we are, Jesus is with us there. When we're feeling scared, when we're feeling alone, when we aren't sure how to feel, God is with us. And that's really good news. I hope that you'll remember that the next time you're feeling scared or alone. And God never tells us not to be afraid without telling us something important that we need to know. And most of the time, it's this good news. We're not alone. Amen. Will you join me now in a time of prayer? Eternal and loving God, we are reminded today of all the ways that you speak life into our experiences, all the ways that you remind us we are not alone, even when we are full of fear or doubt or wonder. We give you thanks for the ways that you accompany us through every moment of our lives. And we pray that you would continue to make your presence felt as we move through this week ahead. As we come into this time of worship, we carry with us on our hearts and in our minds all those who have special needs today. There are those who grieve, and we pray that you would speak words of comfort. There are those who are sick or suffering facing difficult diagnoses or treatments, and we pray that you would speak words of healing. There are those who suffer from worry or stress, unsure where to turn or how to cope. We pray that you would speak words of peace. There are those who are suffering because they do not know that there will be enough. They are struggling to make ends meet. Or there are those who are struggling to find justice. There are those who are struggling to find friendship. There are those who are just struggling. We pray that you would speak words of hope, that you would speak words of provision and care. And Lord, help us to speak those words of life as well. As those who have received the good news of a risen Christ, send us out, God, to be the bearers of that good news in our broken and hurting world. 
Help us to be your people as we serve one another and as we serve you. For it's in Christ's name that we pray, the way that he has taught, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, as those who have heard the good news of a risen Christ, we cannot contain or hold on to that news just for ourselves. No, we have been now called and sent as evangelists into the world. We bring our gifts, our tithes, all that we have and all that we are, and we offer them now to God and Christ, asking that they might be used to bless the world with the good news we have received. Amen. Our second reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord, descending from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of this holy word.
fear is a natural response to things that make us uncomfortable. Fear is a normal and everyday response to the challenging things that we face. As a child, I was deeply afraid of needles. When I was five years old and had to get my booster shots so that I could go to kindergarten, the nurses decided to give me all of my booster shots in the back of my legs in my calves. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever had tetanus shots before, but they hurt really, really bad at the injection site. I couldn't even walk. And that created a fear of needles for me. It was so bad that I had to be sometimes held down at the doctor's office to be given shots. And that fear felt insurmountable. Today, in our gospel reading in Matthew, we find the disciples at a point where they are so full of fear that it is in insurmountable as well. To them, fear ruled everything that they did. I mean, they did lose their leader and teacher, the one whom that they had thought earlier in the week was coming to overthrow all of the corrupt government and religious officials, and even more impressively, kick out the Romans, who had taken control of the land of Israel. Only a few short days later to find out that the very man they thought was going to do the kicking out would be beaten, stripped, cursed, and killed by those officials religious leaders, and the Roman government. Now, they had nobody anymore. And many of, and with no clear direction, many of them fled the scene. Out of fear, they may have very well been the next to suffer death by the cross. But there were some that stayed along the way. This particular post-resurrection scene is one of those. Similar to last week, Mary Magdalene and, in this particular version, another Mary go to the tomb. They go to the garden to prepare Jesus' body with the burial oils and incense and things of that day for his final resting. When they arrive in the garden, they make their way to the tomb, and they're discussing who's going to move this rock, because it's huge, and it's covered most of the tomb. Thunder crashes, lightning rolls, and an earthquake happens in front of the tomb and in front of their very eyes. And the stone is then moved out of the way. But maybe even more impressive or more thought-provoking is that there is a man sitting on top of the rolled away stone at the tomb. The text says that the Marys were frightened by what they had seen and they had witnessed, but this messenger relays this message. Do not be afraid. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He is no longer here. He is alive. Go tell the others that Jesus will meet you in Galilee. Look, if you don't believe me, look at the place where he is laid. He is not there anymore. Go tell the disciples quickly. And so Mary and then Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they go. They leave quickly 
to go and tell the remaining disciples, I'm sure still in awe and at wonder of what they had just seen. When we find the word suddenly, almost immediately after they turned to, ta to take it back to find those disciples to tell them what they had seen, Jesus appears to them as well. And all he has to do is say one word. Greetings. The Marys, they stop in their own tracks. They bend down and they worship Jesus at his feet. And Jesus, seeing them do this, relays a similar message. Marys, don't be afraid. Go and tell my brothers, the disciples, to meet me in Galilee. They will see me there. Friends, as I stated at the beginning of this sermon, fear is a natural part of our lives. It is a factor that plays into all sorts of things, including everyday decisions that we make. Sometimes I wonder if fear drives us as a society. Sometimes I wonder if fear drives our own hearts. You see, this world that we live in thrives on fear and the results that come from it. Now, I don't want you to hear me say that fear is not, that fear is a bad thing. It most certainly is not. There are things such as survival instincts that kick in to help us survive. Fight or flight responses are a part of that. It is natural for us to go through those things. As it would have been for the disciples, in many of the readings of the death and resurrection of Christ, we do a lot of parsing on how Peter and the other disciples react to the death of Jesus. And sometimes I wonder if they get a bad rap occasionally. They literally do the normal human thing. They were in the middle of a life or death situation. They very well could have died for being followers of Jesus. You see, they don't have the advantage that we, some 2,000 years later, have. We can see into the future of the text. We see the glorious resurrection three days later. But they don't. They are so invested emotionally, mentally, philosophically in this literal, political, social, and religious revolution that they can only see that the plan that Jesus had laid out before them, or what they thought that Jesus had laid out before them, blow up in their faces. They needed hope, assurance, anything that they might be able to cling on to in that moment. And that won't show up for three whole days. 72 hours. First in the form of an angel to Mary and Mary Magdalene. And then in the form of Jesus himself. For you see, do not be afraid is the message. 
Did you know that the phrase, fear not, do not be afraid, have no fear, it shows up in the Bible a lot. Somewhere around 300 times it is mentioned, do not fear. But let's be honest here. If any of us today had an experience where the whole earth shook, where the lightning and the thunder rolled and your house was moved off of its foundation six feet and then on top of your roof an angel sat, you might just freak out a tiny bit. You might have just a little bit of fear in that moment. And then, that heavenly being who's sitting on your roof tells you to not be afraid? What an intense spiritual moment. And yet, he says again, do not be afraid. Just like the women at the tomb in Matthew, those four words give us permission to breathe. To take in what has been said and shown to us. But then... The angel says, look, Jesus is not here. Jesus who was crucified is not dead. He is alive. And I wonder if that gives us the same semblance of comfort and hope that it did the Marys. Jesus' work was not and is not done. Death was only the beginning of this great spiritual revolution. There was hope beginning to take hold in them and maybe us in this moment. Go tell the disciples the angel tells them, and they go. But I wonder if even as they were quickly returning, they began to discuss and contemplate about whether what they had seen was just a figment of their imagination. Maybe some skepticism came in to this equation. Then all skepticism leaves. Jesus himself shows up. It is unimaginable. He had died. The angel was right. He is alive. Greetings into their knees. At that word, the Marys fall. Now there is no skepticism. There might be some fear, but there is more hope. Hope has overtaken and leads them to continue to send the message. I have a friend who one time told me that there are three important things that a person must include in their story about spiritual awakenings. Those three things are experience, strength, and hope. We see each of these things in this post-resurrection scene in Matthew's Gospel. 
Friends, that experience is fear. I have no doubt in my mind that fear is something that can drive us to stop doing anything and everything we are called to do. It is an experience that we all corporately share in some ways, and yet at the same time can have our own personal fears in our own lives. Now, I want to reiterate here again, there is nothing wrong with being afraid or having fear. It is normal. But we also have strength. That stuff that pushes us to be courageous. To push us through difficult times. This strength can make us stand up to those things that we're afraid of. And even push through them. And on the other side of those fears, we may find that we weren't quite as damaged as we thought we were all along. But the most important thing that we have is hope. Hope is the part of this that creates the courage and the strength to stand up to fear and discomfort. Hope that was instilled with us and in us from the very beginning of time. God did not leave us to dwell in fear all the time. God gave us hope, a drive to see tomorrow, and all the wonderful things that it will bring. So in the words of the angel and of Jesus, do not be afraid. The world is not ending. It is growing and changing and becoming more and more beautiful in the light of the love of God. It is us to, uh, up to us to be the messengers of this promise that was given to us by Jesus and this heavenly being. Tell all my family that I will meet them soon. Friends, go in the strength and hope of the beautiful day that is today and the beauty that will be tomorrow. Amen.
And now, friends, go with this benediction. The peace of God be in your heart. The grace of God be in your words. The love of God be in your hands. The joy of God be in your souls. And in the song that you in your life sings. Amen.